Hello, everybody. We're back. Uh, and uh, uh, we're back for the last session uh, with two talks and a keynote, uh, right, uh, about um, the, the woman who built the internet. Um, so that I think it will be a keynote that will that a lot of people will actually uh, like and discover a great history uh, uh, from the woman point of view about how the internet was built. But before uh, before we receive uh, in the three different tracks, uh, we will receive at least in the main track where we are right now, uh, Christina Voskoglu, who is a senior director at the research at Slash Data, so one of the main developer marketing and developer research uh, data company. And she will talk with us about the evolution of the API developer community and how to effectively reach its diverse segment. So a lot of people talk about how to reach developers, how developers make the new king, how APIs should be targeted to the right developer audience. So this talk is really for you about uh, the ability to know your developer segment and target the right ones when you are actually uh, launching uh, APIs or exposing them to to other uh, to other companies and the developer uh, community. So I will have uh, Christina joining us. So she's kind of walking on the stage, right? Uh, yeah, it's a large digital stage. Hello, Christina, how are you? Hey, my day, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, talking from Greece, right? Yep. It's an international event, right? Uh, worldwide uh, um, speakers. So uh, let's not make our attendees wait and let's hear from your insight about developer marketing uh, and data uh, research. All right, let me try and share my screen. Yeah, that's always a challenge, sharing the screen. <laughs> okay, application window, right, that's better. There we go. Can you see yeah. my screen we now? Screen, we can hear your sound. Uh, the stage is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm really happy to be here uh, today with you. As Mary said, I'm Senior Research Director for Slash Data. And we'll be discussing the evolution of the developer community out there and how it has grown and how diverse it is, and therefore how you can segment it to target it more effectively. But before I do that, please allow me to very, very quickly introduce Slash Data to you so that you, if nothing else, understand where the data comes from that I'm about to show you. So um, we help the world understand developers. We survey more than 30K developers annually across multiple sectors, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and based on this research, we um, show people where developers, who developers are, so the size of the community, the segments, um, the tooling decisions that they make, so the te technologies they're adopting, and where they're going next, so emerging platforms and emerging trends. Um, some of the big guys in the industry are our clients and um, many others as well, just a few names here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, Okay, so what we do, as I said, uh, we survey 30K uh, plus developers annually. We do that through two survey waves annually. We have around 18 to date, and actually there's a 19th running as we speak. So if you are a developer, please buy, uh, pass by our booth and I'll tell you how to join uh, the crowd in answering the questions. Um, we reach developers from 10 development areas, um, shown on the left here, so mobile, desktop, web, and so on. Um, mind you, these are not distinct uh, audiences, not distinct groups. I'll show you how they overlap in a minute. Um, and we reach developers through more than 87 uh, partners and channels each time, and they're not the same 87 every single time. And they range from really, really small local meetups to really large vendor uh, communities. So in that way, we're pretty confident we have a representative sample of the dev community. All right, and with that out of the way, this is what we'll be talking about in this session. So I'll show you the growth of the global developer population. We'll discuss uh, the key drivers behind that boom. Uh, we'll see if developers have any power as decision makers. And then we'll start discussing how diverse the developer ecosystem is by uh, focusing here on the profile of mature and emerging development sectors and seeing how they're different. Um, and then how exactly you're supposed to reach this diverse uh, developer um, say, um, ecosystem more effectively. So to segment or not to segment, that is a question. So let's dive in. Um, 
Okay, so this is based on our survey data, but also um, um, other resources that we use. I'm very happy to discuss methodology with anyone who is interested in our booth. I'll be there for another hour after uh, this talk. Um, but uh, based on our data and all those resources, we find that uh, the developer ecosystem currently has um, a bit north than 20 million developers, 20.4 estimated, and that is 30% up as compared to two years ago. So compared to the end of 2017, we had 15.7 uh, back then. We now have, not now, but end of 2019, we had 20.4 million. Um, and even if we employ a rather conservative model, uh, we find that the developed population will in fact exceed 22 million by the end of 2020. So we expect to be somewhere between 22 and 23 million by the end of 2020. Okay, so what are those 24, 20.4 million, sorry, doing? Uh, where are they involved in those 10 sectors that we are researching? Um, so first thing to note here is that uh, all these numbers, of course, uh, don't add up. If you try to add them up, they add up to far more than 20.4, and that's the overlap I talked about. So um, on average, each developer is involved in 2.6 of these sectors. In fact, 67% are involved in at least two software sectors and 22% uh, in more than four. Um, and that's not very odd, is it? Because you may have a backend in the cloud and you can have a front end the web and the mobile to have both types of experiences and an ML API to go with that. So that's set four sectors uh, just like that. Um, the second thing to note here is the growth rates uh, of these sectors. So web is the biggest uh, and it's growing. Remember we said it was 30% uh, increase um, in two years. So 2019 to 2017, but that was not uniform across all these sectors. So we have machine learning, AI, data science, that was this, the sector, the one sector that by far grew the most by 46%. That is, while we have other sectors, the more, let's say, established by now, um, there are desktop and mobile that grew by 20 and 25% uh, respectively. While we have backend and web, they grew just above average. So this is what the sectors look like. And as I said, there is no such thing as, you know, um, a desktop only developer. Well, there is, but it's not so common. So we need to be careful about that. Okay, so such a big boom um, implies that something happened in the background. So one of the key drivers uh, behind the boom was the rise of cloud, um, several cloud technologies. So we have been tracking consistently through our surveys um, the technologies that uh, backend developers use. And I'm showing you here the trend for the last two years. And as you can see, some of them grew really fast. So what happened here is that with the rise of all the as a service models, so database as a service, platform as a services, and, and so on. Um, we have the cost being lowered, so even startups can start a business um, without having to set up a server or anything. And therefore, the barrier to entry immediately dropped um, as the cost dropped. Um, and then we have containers, who were in fact uh, the ones that grew the most. So you can see 23% points in two years. Um, and also uh, container orchestration tools, um, but then also DBAS and, and sorry, private uh, and serverless architectures. So um, uh, backend uh, teams didn't have, you know, the hassle of dealing with all the, all the servers. It's, you know, um, serverless does that for you. So, um, Therefore, cloud, oh, not to mention also um, the processing power that people get through cloud that they wouldn't get otherwise uh, locally. So dealing with big data, working, crunching um, large amounts of data became easier and less expensive. So that was one reason uh, behind um, the boom. The other, of course, uh, was the emergence, the, the boom of APIs. So here I'm going to show you just the case of ML APIs we asked ML developers and data scientists to take in our survey how they're involved in machine learning and data science. Um, and then you get to see, of course, that many of them are learners. But that aside, 
uh, what I want you to focus on is that third bar there. Um, so it's the third most popular answer that they consume third party APIs, such as vision, speech, or recommendation APIs. And that's how they're involved in machine learning. So one in four got involved through using an API. And that uh, obviously is part of the huge increase that we see in the ML uh, sector. And what do they do? So here, um, we also ask them, why do you use ML? Uh, what, what do you do with it? Um, and here I'm comparing those who consume third-party APIs to those, to everyone else really, um, in the field. And um, what I'm highlighting is that those who consume third-party APIs are um, most likely to be either building new ML products or adding ML functionality to their existing apps. So they're extending their applications or otherwise, because they're doing, they can do something a lot smarter, they feel that this way they can increase their chances of securing profitable projects um, or otherwise contribute to the research around AI ML, not in general scientific research, that's lower actually compared to everyone else and not to improve organizational process. So what this really means is that it's, it's really um, developers from other sectors pouring in the sector because, and that was facilitated um, by the existence of um, APIs. Um, so with that happening, um, something else also happened. Um, developers then started going, moving away slightly, but not too much uh, from their natural habitat of software products and services and into the so-called vertical industries. So this is the professional developers here and where other uh, company is active, which industry, of course, we track far more industries. I'm just showing you here a few examples. So for example, people pouring into health and medical, um, how that happened. I mean, yeah, taking advantage of cloud, but also um, ML and thing robotics, computer vision, diagnostic uh, algorithms, uh, predictive algorithms and so on, um, that led to, to a boom there. Um, financial services is also very interesting because through uh, payments APIs, for example, financial institutions, you know, feel they can reach uh, more um, more people, a wider audience, um, and therefore uh, they're trying to attract more developers uh, to build a developer community, and they employ more developers. Also, the rise of private cloud made financial institutions somewhat more confident uh, in terms of security. And so given the significant uh, cost reductions, they went into that. Also for data analytics and business intelligence, all those APIs around visualization, um, the cloud, of course, um, processing power, um, all the um, uh, databases as a service, uh, all the uh, machine learning as a service, and all of that uh, facilitated uh, all the extensions to reporting extensions to ERP and CRM systems that led to this, developers going into those sectors. Now, all of those, so the ecosystem grows um, and it's not just just people crunching code in the corner that you don't, don't need to worry about. What we find consistently over the last few years is that developers are in fact um, very actively involved in tooling decisions. So 71%, that's really close to three quarters of them, are involved in tooling decisions. Um, nearly half, so 45%, say they are at least influencers, so influencing decision makers. And um, at least 20, so more than 20%, there's some overlap here, um, so I'm not going to add them up, um, are actually either making the final selection decision or uh, approving budgets. So you need to reach developers uh, and by reaching developers you're reaching the decision makers in seven out of ten uh, cases so that's why you need to um, but what does it mean reaching developers are they just one concrete set of people that will just react to whatever you have to say in a similar manner well no as i said this is a diverse set and this is a quick way of showing you how diverse it is so developers who are into different sectors are quite different. Um, so we find that it is the least experience that leapfrog into the emerging sectors. You'll see here, this is years of experience in software development. 
um, dark blue being those who have six plus years of experience in it. So you see that machine learning uh, developers are uh, not that experienced not as compared to backend services. Uh, games, of course, we know it's, it's um, um, the realm of hobbies in many cases who are just trying their hand in something fun. Um, but the point is that it's the, it's the least experienced and uh, we've seen it um, in, uh, in other cases as well in the past. Um, similarly, it is the younger uh, who uh, jump into the emerging sectors. So you see that 42%, the Greens are the younger age groups here, 42% um, of ML uh, AI developers are uh, in fact under the age of 25 and that's 37% for VR and 35 for AR. So all the emerging sectors have a younger population than um, these sectors that are more established like backend and web and so on. So that implies that um, there are huge training opportunities here for vendors. So you need to know your audience. If you're, you're talking to a VR um, developers, you're very likely an ML developers who are very likely talking to younger people, to learners. So supporting them in the learning, for example, is a very good idea. So that's why you need to know what's the profile of your specific audience. Um, another thing now that we're in the age topic, uh, another thing in which uh, the young people um, are a little bit different um, is their attitude towards open source. So we ask developers whether they contribute to open source, not whether they use it. We have asked before, we know most of developers use open source. The question is, do they contribute? And as you can see here on the left, the younger they are, the more likely they are to be contributing um, as opposed to the older um, developers. And why do they contribute? If you look at the, on the right, uh, the younger they are, the more likely they are to contribute because they want to learn, they want to improve their coding skills also because it's fun. Um, sadly, we miss our sense of fun as we grow older, um, shame. Um, and also it makes them feel part of, they belong somewhere, so the sense of community is really strong uh, with open source. So supporting a community here and supporting them in a way that they learn is really important. And by the way, whether they contribute or not, uh, even from non-contributors, we have data that shows that um, they, they are looking for support in open source from vendors. So just something to keep in mind. So this gives you an idea of how the next generation that is coming in and what happened as the, the barriers to entry were uh, lowered. So how, th it is a diverse ecosystem and how do, you, um, how do you reach out to it? So we think segmentation is the answer, So, but before we show you how, um, we asked, uh, we survey not just developers, but also the leaders um, in the developer relations space and dev marketing as well. So they asked them if and how they, they segment their audiences. Sadly, one in four uh, don't. Um, and those out of those who do, um, several tend to use the wrong dimensions. They don't, they go about it in the wrong way. Uh, what's the wrong way? It's using technology. So if you try to use programming languages or type of development, desktop web, and so on, um, as I demonstrated um, about type of development, you won't get clear cut groups. You won't get segments because simply because developers will use um, more than one languages, more than one types of development. So it's not pointless just labeling someone as Java developer. He will be using something else uh, on the side. Um, so to give you an, another clue, if you need one, of why segmenting on technology is a bad idea. Um, well, the other problem with technologies is that they have the bad habit of dying on you. So this is a picture from ancient history, 2012. Uh, we have been gathering data since then, before that actually. And that's BlackBerry and Symbian. And look what happened to them. And not eight years later, it's just two years later. So um, 2012 to 2014, uh, BlackBerry lost um, most of its uh, usage, most of its user base, right? So if you had created segments back then, mobile developer segments based on platform use, well, so you would find that some segments were quite empty um, and other platforms uh, have 
um, uh, reason in, in the meantime, and then you wouldn't have taken account of those. So segmenting on technology is a bad idea. I'm happy to provide more details to anyone who's interesting. So what do we do? So here's a solution instead of more problems. Um, what we do is that we let the, our data speak unsupervised. Unsupervised means no assumptions, no prior assumptions made. You need to make an assumption and theoretically define your population, so your, your whole targeted audience, um, which may not be as trivial as you may think. But once you have done that, just let the data guide you um, without taking technology into consideration. Just use demographics, firmographics, you know, roles, companies, and so on. Um, so we did that as an exercise. So what I'm showing you here is six personas that we came up with. We're not saying that this is the one uh, segmentation model everyone should be using. Um, it's just an example of how to segment. Uh, so without making any assumptions whatsoever, we ended up with six uh, segments that actually follow the evolution path um, of developers, starting from young learners here who are young and they are uh, learners and they're not professionals that is and they're not buying anything they're broke and moving on to young professionals they're juniors someplace they're just programmers they don't have any say the middle standards are a bit more specialized architects and so on they have some say uh, all the way to seasoned decision makers who really uh, call the shots um, and they're older of course and in parallel to these uh, we have the emerging extenders who are really uh, mostly in small companies or startups and having a background um, in the more mature sectors. They're extending to AR, VR, IoT and machine learning to um, build a better business. And otherwise we have those inexperienced loaners on the side where somewhere quietly in the corner, they're doing something. They're, they're main designers, some of them also. Um, and they're not working in any teams, not making any money, it's just for them. So this is just an example of how to build. Now, suppose you have built a model, how do you know it works? So you know that because uh, your segments behave differently and you want them to behave differently so that you can approach them with a different message, a targeted message just for them. So here's just an example of those six personas and their attitudes towards um, emerging technology, we'll just pick two, we track a lot of them. Here's DevOps and robotics. So you can see, for example, that middle standards and decision decision, uh, decision makers um, are far more into DevOps than anyone else, while extenders, for example, are far more into robotics. So that's how we know a segmentation works. Okay, so putting everything together, what I've said here, if you are to remember six things out of what I had said, one, the developer community has seen an amazing growth and we expect uh, the number of developers to be more than above 22 million by the end of the year. Two, it was the boom in APIs and cloud technologies uh, and then also the rise of open source communities behind this boom, behind the, the growth. Third, as the barriers to entry were lowered because of this boom in APIs and cloud, the typical profile of the developer is diluted. Just about anyone can develop something. Um, and there's therefore no such thing as a typical developer. So um, on the other hand, you also have developers taking decisions. They're influencers, 71% of them are. So diverse on one hand, they are the decision makers on the other. You have to do something about it. Um, and segmenting your audience is key to maximize the return on your developer outreach investments. And you know you've done a good job of defining personas um, when each persona is behaving consistently, so systematically roughly the same, predictable way, um, and differently from the other personas. So that's it. Um, if you would like to um, play around with our population data and estimate the size of your developer population, your target audience, uh, just Copy this link. If you don't have the time to copy it now, just pass by our booth. We'll give you access. Um, and then you can play around. No subscription required and figure out how many developers there are in regions and using specific languages and so on. And that's all for me. Any questions? Hi, Christina. In the last minute, we have for one question that we have from Rahul uh, Digger from PayPal. Um, even if you wouldn't segment based on technology, uh, how important is to understand what technology the developers are familiar with to answer questions like, should we launch a REST or GraphQL API? 
it is important to understand it, but what it is important to understand is how they decide to use technology X versus Y. And what we have found over and over again is that, you know, just by tracking the usage, okay, so they, they migrate to another tool, why? You, you cannot predict that uh, well enough. Well, if, if you look into the motivation, so we have found that the motivation is the very reason why they went to development to begin with is a very good predictor of choices. So you have to build a model that will help you predict those choices. And that model is segmentation you know, based on motivations and everything. Yeah. Does that answer? Thank yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, we will have, uh, yeah, you can disconnect now your 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 screen and thank you very much for being there with us. Uh, so you. yeah, if you want to know more about the market research for developers, you can go on the booth on slash data or reach, reach uh, Christina directly. And thank now you. we have our, uh, uh, our speaker, our next speaker about KPIs for APIs, a topic that has been addressed many times today about like finding the right metrics, making the right uh, return investment calculation, uh, and also aligning uh, business uh, with uh, with APIs. So I'm glad to receive like Eric Horsney. So Eric, hope you're doing well. Uh, you can share your screen, uh, finding the sharing screen button, and uh, and then we'll be glad to have you to have you uh, for uh, 25 minutes. Right? Do you are you able to share your screen? Yes, I am. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfectly. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Share. Did you have a birthday recently? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's part of the human touch I wanted to preserve. <laughs> um, APIs are about human stuff more than anything else. Uh, let me check if I do this application window. So, entire screen. If you're not afraid of all your tabs, you can share your entire screen. That's, uh, yeah, I wanted to share my uh, my entire screen, actually. I'm open to that. Let's, let's go for it. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't work. Let me... Uh, force the software yeah. to do. So meaning reboot it. <laughs> it's coming. So share. So right. finally, the software problems are as much as yeah. hardware problems. Let, let me leave and, uh, and yep. join again. Let's try again. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write the questions into the, the chat section. Uh, write a lot of questions about the AI and KPIs. So let's try this time, Eric. So Eric will, be, Eric will be back in in few seconds. Even if you share just one tab or just the application window? Uh, application window doesn't show me uh, PowerPoint. So, uh, an entire screen. No. I don't know. So entire entire screen doesn't work, right?
Okay, let's try. Let's, let's try. try. Let's do it. It says live. Are we backstage for main stage or main stage right now? Uh, we're in main stage. Okay. My thing says backstage, backstage for main stage. Backstage for yeah. main stage, yes. Okay. Still doesn't work. What do you advise? Uh, maybe you can upload it directly on like a Google slide. Uh, so we have it. Uh, yeah, good point. You can create um, a I'm going to lose all my animations, but that's OK. Again, if you, you can type some questions or some ideas that you have on KPIs for APIs, if you're involved into API programs, internally or externally, or how do you match your uh, API analytics to business objectives? Yeah, don't hesitate to uh, to add some comments so we can, we, uh, Eric may include it in, in his talk. Yeah, so I'm going to put it into um, uh, a Google Chromecast. Uh, yeah, let's be Google saved Chromecast. by the web, right? Let's be yeah. saved by the web. Know that <laughs> the web will save us all. This is the web we want. We want more web. Okay, uploading. Okay. Open with Google Slides. That's uh, that's a bit risky. Maybe check the slides before, right? Else, <laughs> if it doesn't work, maybe we can uh, record the sessions and we will include it in the replays at least. Right? Let me check. Yeah, let me check what it shows right, right now. We can organize a session that you could do that. Chrome tab. Um... Try this, share. So it works, the web saves yeah. us. <laughs> that was a hack, but um, it's yeah. not like it works. Let's, uh, yeah, we'll skip the questions for that, but uh, yeah. Ooh, hold on, it's not working. Yeah, it's broken. Uh, I need to open it with um, Google Slides and then it could kill the whole thing, but let's let's check. Let's see how the web save us or not. Let's see if those all those APIs are um, resilient or not. From desktop right. APIs to web APIs. OK, are we good? Uh, hold on. View full screen. Okay, um, I think we're good. Can we try? Oh. So we'll skip the questions. I, I think you understand because of because of uh, timing. Uh, yeah, and let's do what we can in the last in the next uh, 16, 17 minutes we have. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Okay, yeah. let's go. Um, so KPIs for APIs. Uh, first thing that you cannot see well is. Um, 
Uh, when we look at what happens with COVID, uh, we can think of three benefits that uh, KPIs can bring to uh, the current situation. Uh, one is to lower the risk exposure that organizations have to physical transactions. Uh, another one is to help companies save costs, and they, they need the cash right now, uh, by eliminating redundancies. And the third one, which is the, the one you, you, you all know, is uh, to, to delight customers with self-service, an excellent uh, journey um, for their customers. So now let's, uh, let's do it. Let's see how we can uh, make it happen and see how the API community can help in the current situation. Um, one thing that is important is uh, to understand the power of APIs. Uh, the first thing with APIs is that it is a way for a uh, team to, um, to assess their own success. Once you have a KPI, you know whether we, you've reached it or not. So that's the way your team will know whether it has reached its objective and it's an opportunity to celebrate when it's been reached. Along the journey, when the, the team works, it's uh, also important to have a KPI so that you can focus on things that matter uh, while you're implementing, implementing stuff. And finally, uh, one thing that is uh, uh, critical with KPIs is to establish and maintain a dialogue with uh, stakeholders. Uh, they want to know whether everything uh, that you're doing is going well and whether uh, you, uh, you need support. Uh, by having KPIs, then they can immediately see uh, whether things are going well on your side. So um, what we've done with uh, some colleagues is to uh, look at the 500 uh, API customers uh, that Axway has. And uh, we were able to have conversations with uh, some of them uh, that actually shared the KPIs they're using as part of their program uh, and, and were happy to publish them and uh, get them public. So once you have the data, uh, it's, Eric, it's, uh, Eric, it's yeah. Just say, uh, some people think you are sharing the wrong tab because we just see on C1 we only see the first slide, and so we we don't uh, we don't see the the slides. Ah, okay. 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 Yeah. Some people propose to you share the link, and, and they will be able to to browse it. Yeah, I don't know if you is it. It should be it should be good now. Sorry for that, guys. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> Um, now, so I was, I was saying the, if, if you uh, look at, uh, if you ask customers what are the KPIs they're using, you come up with uh, uh, tons of different ways of measuring their own success. And um, what, what I've done was to look at what those uh, measures uh, look like uh, to see whether we could find uh, ways to create a connection between those KPIs and uh, what business people uh, wanna wanna see, so we can identify groups uh, of uh, uh, of KPIs uh, that will go into details. I'm gonna skip that part because we won't have time to uh, uh, to see see it again twice. But you can see um, how we worked uh, the research, and then we have to think about okay, now that we have all those KPIs, what are those that are the most impactful for our stakeholders? Um, a schematic way of looking at the world is to think about a shareholder. The most important thing for a, stake, a shareholder is the stock uh, price of your company. Uh, and what the, the three uh, indicators that actually influence uh, stock price are your revenue, uh, your cost base, and the risk associated with your operations. Any stakeholders, once they have those one of those three metrics, they can uh, magically and uh, intuitively measure the impact it will have on the, the value of the company. So let's stick to those uh, three classic views of uh, looking at things, revenue, cost, and risk. Um, in a most more modern uh, way of looking at it is to talk about consumption, efficiency, and resilience. Um, I like those terms better. So let's uh, let's have a look at uh, what uh, what we see with our customers. So on the upper left corner, uh, it's about um, uh, growth. So what we've seen with uh, Dun and Bradstreet is that they were able to grow by thirty million dollar 
their business uh, thanks to our APIs. Uh, same with Baird, they were able to grow and attribute the, their growth of business by 50% thanks to APIs. Um, another uh, indicator that I find useful is the um, acquisition of customers. So typically, uh, Permata Bank is a, an uh, Indonesian bank. And what they managed to do through a, a smart API program was to um, multiply their customer acquisition by four. So they measured uh, how many new customers they were getting through the API program. Now, on, the, on, the, on this quadrant, uh, in terms of uh, uh, cl a classic way of measuring your program, is uh, adoption. So typically, all those organizations are measuring the number of API calls per month, per year, uh, typically between 10 million and 10 billion API calls a month. Um, and as we can see, this is not something that we'll talk to uh, all the stakeholders. And this is where we need to create a link between this indicator and the indicator I started with uh, on the upper left corner. Uh, another way of talking about uh, indicators that drive consumption is to talk about uh, a marketplace and the choice you provide in your platform for uh, the community you're welcoming uh, as part of your API. So if we take an example, uh, Hainer, they're uh, a uh, uh, global insurance company for expats. They cover uh, 200 countries. Uh, they have... Uh, uh, 49,000 AIRS partners uh, that are available through their APIs, and they service 10,000 companies. So this is a measure of the choice that you provide to your community uh, through your APIs. Uh, another one is uh, ATPCO, uh, which is um, a company that, that is uh, uh, helping airlines uh, monetize their tickets uh, through distributors. And the choice they're providing through their APIs, uh, they're measuring it uh, with 220 distribution channels uh, that they provide to 440 airlines. So here we can see you know, the publishers and consumers as part of a community, this is a platform. These are key metrics uh, for you to be tracking as part of your success because they are the ones that will drive, uh, again, the, uh, the revenue metrics. Um, RTE, which is a, a, a power distributor in, uh, in Europe, it's actually the, the largest power distributor. In that case, they had to uh, connect and provide access to 1,300 stakeholders, 1,300 stakeholders for a power grid across Europe. Um, uh, an example that we can see with many governments is uh, government typically is made of uh, 12 or 15 or 20 agencies. So to be able to cover and provide the choice of connecting to all those agencies is a metric in itself. Uh, so your coverage ratio here uh, has to be 100%. This is what uh, the um, state of Victoria achieved with their API platform. And we can see that again with uh, the, the government in Belgium. Uh, in their case, they managed to provide access. Uh, they started with 200 uh, data sources, and now it's up to 6,000 data sources, uh, thanks to their API program. Um, another way of uh, uh, measuring choice that we see very often uh, in teams is the number of APIs, which could be a trap, because it is not because you have thousands of uh, APIs available that you're going to be successful. Um, however, once you've uh, reached a certain maturity in your uh, API um, journey, you will be able to start tracking your success by measuring how many APIs corresponding to different well-designed services that you're providing to your, um, uh, to your community. So no, Novartis, for example, in uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, they started with 170 uh, APIs, and now they're uh, tracking towards 450 APIs. Uh, same with uh, Total, the uh, energy company, they're above 100 uh, APIs. And finally, on the consumption side, um, some companies are tracking um, a measure of the transformation they were able to achieve through APIs. So in the case of uh, Commerce Bank or The Star, which is a casino and entertainment group in uh, Asia, 
uh, they're measuring how much uh, it, the their API program is impacting their business. In that case, 80% of their business is done through APIs. So these are consumption indicators. A uh, little break on uh, before we move on to the next kind of uh, indicators. Vision without execution is hallucination. So now uh, let's move on to efficiency. Um, so in this case, uh, efficiency, the most interesting uh, data about efficiency is ROI. So ROI is a secret word that uh, gets many decision makers to understand and listen to what you're saying. So in, in the case of uh, AIFE, which is the uh, French uh, financial platform for the government, um, they were able to measure that their um, API and, and transformation program would cost them 1 billion euro, uh, but they were also able to measure that uh, they were able to recoup um, half a billion every year for two years so that they could uh, get a payback period of only two years out of the API program. This is the way you talk to investors. Another one is uh, the Star Entertainment Group. In their case, uh, they were able to measure and, and show that uh, they could uh, save $4 million uh, with, uh, with the API program. Same with the Toll Customs, which is the, um, the border services in Norway. Uh, Danish Defense, which you know, is the defense in Denmark. Uh, another way that they, um, a, a metric that they tracked was the, the cost savings they could uh, achieve through uh, their API program. In their case, up to uh, 96%. And the other metric is 96%, but in how much time? In six months. Um, so this is about ROI. This is about uh, real money uh, savings. Uh, this is the way you talk to um, uh, every stakeholder part of your program. Now let's have a look at um, the uh, an another indicator of success, uh, which is velocity. So velocity, uh, in the case of uh, the, uh, uh, the French uh, family uh, social services, what they, what they were able to measure is their ability to release innovation to their base. So it, uh, they've managed to multiply it by seven. So they're seven times faster now to release innovation to their, um, uh, to their, um, uh, to their base. Same with high mark, in their case, 60 times. So if you think about the metric of what is um, my time to release a feature, you can, you, you can measure it directly or uh, measure the improvement in velocity that you've uh, obtained. Uh, an, an example like this is uh, CMA CGM, which is a, um, an ocean uh, shipping company. Uh, what, they, what they were able to measure is that in the past, their customers could um, benefit from their innovation every three months. And now they can stick to their users' uh, need uh, way better because they can release those innovations on a weekly basis. Uh, same with the uh, KGI Bank in, uh, in Asia. And they're able, they, they were able to track the, the time to open an account. So, and it went from three hours to two minutes. This is a huge driver to your user experience uh, driven by efficiency. And this is gonna drive uh, either cost saving or uh, re revenue increase. Now let's talk about uh, cost avoidance. As, as we know, APIs is a great way to uh, get rid of uh, ad hoc one-to-one um, uh, -one integrations uh, and, and replace it with a contract that can service multiple needs. Um, in the case of NG, which is a utility company, what they, uh, what they measured is that thanks to their program, they were able to divide their cost by three um, by uh, dividing the number of integrations they had to uh, uh, take care of in order to uh, take care of their community. Same with uh, the Milan airports. Uh, what they uh, what they measured was that uh, thanks to the API program, they were able to um, uh, to save thirty percent on their integration cost uh, by just implementing APIs rather than the uh, 
their old architecture. And uh, another example I like a lot is uh, BNP Paribas. Uh, BNP Paribas Personal Finance is using uh, uh, the APIs across uh, 33 countries. And they, they actually created a catalog of all those APIs. And thanks to that catalog, they could actually detect redundancies uh, between countries of APIs that were pretty much doing the same thing, and then uh, cut some of the programs and put those resources onto more uh, productive uh, activities. Uh, still in uh, efficiency, um, one, uh, you know, one uh, impact that uh, APIs can have is on, uh, uh, is on productivity. In the case of Amerisource Bergen, which is a leader in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry in the US, um, Amerisource Bergen was able to calculate the time saved by field uh, medical personnel uh, to service the pharmacies. Thanks to their API program, they were able to increase their productivity by 40%. And this, this is something that is uh, useful to track as part of an API program. Um, another example I like is, uh, we, we talked about them earlier, it's the, the borders in Norway. They were uh, calculating the time it takes for a truck to go through the border, and they were able to go five times faster uh, thanks to their, to their program. Or B3, uh, an exchange in, in Brazil, they were able to ship data to their customer, which is their uh, business model. Um, in fifty percent faster than before, thanks to their program. Of Fannie Mae in the in the U.S. for uh, for mortgage um, insurance, uh, what they what they calculated in their case is what what was the impact of their program on the time to troubleshoot um, issues, and they realized that they could go five times faster. So those metrics all go into efficiency. If you pick one of them, uh, when you talk about efficiency, it will resonate with um, uh, the people you need to convince when uh, investment time comes. Another transition. If you can measure it, you can't improve it. All right, so the third um, category is, uh, is on resilience. So in the case of uh, resilience, what... Um, uh, what we see is a typical classic uh, metric, which is about availability. So availability is uh, typically measured um, with the platform availability, and uh, people typically track this between 99.9 and 99.99%, which is uh, not that important for a startup. But when you actually support a platform of thousands of companies, and uh, or millions in the case of uh, IAIFE, it is the most critical uh, metric uh, you need to track and you need to make sure that it's uh, always on, otherwise you're out of business. Uh, talking about resilience and risk, uh, second category is about compliance. So when it comes to compliance, it can be compliance to standards or regulation. Uh, let's talk about regulation. Um, ACOS, which is a social security in France uh, with a 500 billion euro uh, budget, what they, um, uh, they had to comply with uh, the open data uh, regulation in, um, in, uh, in France. And uh, it was binary. They, they either complied or not. So they, they reached the goal. Same with many banks like uh, uh, Sparbank or uh, Group BPC. Uh, another in, uh, in banking. Now let's talk about other areas because it's funny, actually regulation and standards are everywhere. Uh, in the case of NATS, which is the air traffic control um, in system in the, uh, in the UK, they had to comply with the uh, single European sky uh, regulation and they, they passed it thanks to their API program. Uh, same with uh, Tim, uh, they wanted to adopt an, uh, an open API, the open API uh, TM forum uh, specifications and they passed it. So again, um, this compliance thing looks like a uh, burden, but it, it is the cost of doing business. And uh, it is important to track these uh, and report this as part of your API journey. Uh, finally, on uh, uh, two, two, two little things. Uh, an, an emerging indicator is um, uh, resilience, 
when it comes to the skill set you have available in-house uh, to support your program. So um, in the case of Commerce Bank, they were able to track uh, the number of developers uh, allocated to their program that went from 15 to 80. And it is a great way to make sure that your organization is resilient to anything that can happen. And finally, uh, let's talk about security, uh, cyber security or security uh, when it comes to uh, resilience. With uh, COVID, we've seen uh, the number of threats uh, going up and uh, it's actually impacting lots of organizations and a measure of uh, the uh, uh, success of your team when it comes to security can be uh, the time to address a security threat. Uh, and uh, an example of Sirius, which is a, a media platform based on the radio in the US, uh, they were able to uh, uh, go 10 times faster uh, thanks to their API program. That's it. So um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, lesson learned, um, what, one thing that is very important is to make sure that you link uh, your uh, operational KPIs to numbers and indicators that can be understood and related to by your stakeholders. So um, when it comes to revenue, you need to make sure that any revenue you generate uh, that you track through usage or uh, through the type of transaction that you support is attributed to your program. So that's attribution. Um, the second thing you need to be, to look at is allocation of cost. So uh, it's it looks like jargon, but uh, uh, in accounting, when you um, uh, when you have a cost, you need to allocate it, and you need to be allocated your cost safely. One thing that we see more of, more and more often is that company use API uh, metrics like the number of calls per uh, met per organization within the company to allocate the cost of the API program. So that's very useful also to, uh, to share the cost of your investments. And finally, uh, this is uh, something that was mentioned uh, quite a few times earlier, the direct monetization of your API, meaning you're gonna charge somebody based on a pricing plan for APIs is an exception. Less than 5% of organizations do it. The actual monetization and real money is uh, made out of indirect usage of your data or indirect distribution of the audience that your company was able to reach thanks to a great application. Now, um, let's uh, let's go let, let's go about uh, identifying what are the right KPIs uh, depending on where you stand in the. Uh, in your journey, in your uh, in the maturity of your program, um, so I encourage everybody to think in terms of OKRs rather than KPIs. But that's uh, that would be another conversation we won't have time today. Um, so if we measure what matters, uh, you need to look at the four areas uh, that matter to reach success in the digital economy. Um, so you need great products based on a platform that is not only a technical platform, but also a digital platform um, that is tracked and uh, fostered through a program and all that based on a strategy. Uh, so these are the four areas that are gonna be uh, helping you measure your um, maturity in the API journey. So for example, if we take um, a bank that's just gone through a PSD2 uh, compliance, uh, you can tell that they're intermediate when it comes to uh, releasing products. Um, the platform has started, uh, but they do not necessarily need to have a strategy or a program. Same with a company that would have created its first API just to address a requirement from a customer or a partner. This is where lots of companies stand right now uh, based on the, the work we see um, in the Catalyst team at XY. So in the case of this uh, company in fairly early stage, uh, what matters to them in terms of the, the three families and three categories of APIs is uh, adoption when it comes to uh, revenue, uh, velocity when it comes to uh, uh, the cost, you wanna make sure that you can show that you're efficient 
and of course compliance uh, if it was all about complying with uh, with the regulation um, now as as the organization mature and gets uh, better and better and experts uh, years after years and here I say five years but in you know it can take ten years um, you're gonna have to select what KPIs matter to you as part of that journey so that you can move on to the next stage that you decided you wanted to reach uh, for the next year. And the selection of uh, your KPIs will gradually depend on where you come from and where you're going to and the, the focus you want to give for the months to come because no team is unlimited and it is essential to prioritize things. And finally, as a takeaway, uh, this is the KPIs for APIs takeaway. Uh, if you think about uh, what uh, what are the absolute KPIs that will work very well in any circumstances, um, it, one is about consumption or revenue, and you can actually track and report it directly once you've created the uh, uh, attribution of revenue. Uh, and the other one is about efficiency, which would work well once you've done all your work with uh, the allocation. And the other one is on resilience. So these are KPIs that you can report to yourself and to your stakeholders as part of a dashboard. Um, and the uh, drivers uh, that you can use in order to create this allocation or attribution uh, are those ones that we just covered. Uh, so that could be a cheat sheet for you guys to uh, think of. And um, I'd be very happy to uh, to get your feedback on, on this. And um, this is... Uh, Continuous improvement, work in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it was really insightful, and I know this KPIs for APIs question happens uh, uh, all the time. Uh, for respecting the time in, in our in our last uh, keynote speaker, uh, yeah, um, uh, we will not take any questions, but uh, I'm I'm sure people can reach you or in either in the chat, either uh, on the Axway booth uh, there, so you can. All right. uh, yeah, thank you very much, Eric. You can uh, unlock your screen share. Uh, and now, to uh, last but not least, right, we're really glad to have on stage uh, Claire Evans. So I don't know exactly how to describe her. She will do, do that better than me, but she's a rock band artist. She's a journalist. She's a bestseller author. Uh, she wrote a book, um, a wonderful book that's actually it's quite enlightening about uh, broadband, the woman who built the internet. So sometimes our vision of the history is really biased by some, uh, uh, let's say, male privileges, or at least uh, it's 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 uh, let's say uh, shared by by males. But actually, uh, it really, uh, this book relates how uh, actually a lot of women were part of building the internet, but we never hear the story. And so she will be here to uh, tell this story to us based on her book. Uh, a lot of people of the community wanted to have her uh, at one of uh, our API Days conferences. Now it is the time. I'm really glad to have uh, to come on stage, uh, Claire Evans. So Claire, you can come on stage and ask for yeah, sharing your screen and uh, sharing your audio. Uh, you just have to find the sh like sharing screen button and hope it works. Hi, Claire. Very glad to Hi. have you. Hi. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, let's see if I can figure this out. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to work just fine. Hey, ooh, meta. Okay. Yeah, oh, that's really meta here. Okay, um, I'll let you on stage. Windows and Windows. Take your time. And we're really glad to, we're really glad to have you uh, for the API Days community. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, I'm going to run this keynote. Everything cool? Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Claire, obviously, and I'm... So honored and excited to be here with you this afternoon or this morning or this evening or whenever it is, wherever it is that you're watching this. Uh, I'm sad I can't be here in person, uh, but I think there's something very appropriate on some level about a keen about the history of women in computing being given by a woman inside a computer, quite literally. So perhaps everything happens for a reason. I want to preface this by saying first that this talk is sort of coming from uh, from outside of the world of APIs and will be a little bit more general 
uh, in terms of a history of women in technology and in computing. But I hope that you will find a lot to draw from in my emphasis on users, on building and designing for users, on community, and on making meaningful connections from data, because uh, for me, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, I'm a journalist and a, what do you call me, a rock star artist. But um, I do have some bona fides. Uh, for one, my father worked for Intel for most of his life. And when I was a kid, we always had computers in the home. Um, I never thought of the computer as being something that was you know, for boys or for girls any more than I thought the toaster or the television was for boys or for girls. And as proof, here's a video of me <laughs> at a very young age, beating the CD-ROM game Myst, which I was very obsessed with and made my father film me beat. Uh, I share this because I want to share the fact that when I was a kid, I always felt that the computer was an extension of myself. It was part of my identity. It was part of who I was. It was my home. And when the web came along, like everyone else in my generation, I immediately felt the same way about it. I felt that it was a place of discovery and connection and community and, and learning. But something happened <laughs> between the time that this video was taken and the moment that I sit here now. Something happened to me, something happened to the web, that's for sure, many things happened to the web. For one, it stopped feeling like an extension of myself. It stopped feeling safe. It stopped feeling fun uh, to me as a person and more importantly, perhaps as a woman. So a few years ago, I started to ask myself, what happened and when? I looked at the past. I always looked at the past. And I talked to a lot of older women about their experiences in the early computing industry and on the first waves of the web and before that, the internet. And in finding these women and talking to them, I found a lineage uh, that could include someone like me. And I found a version of the established tech history that gives us all you know, amazing tech mothers and grandmothers to emulate. But I think more importantly, I found something else, which was the seeds of a different future. And by that I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I found myself researching a technology or an approach to technology that just had it been implemented early enough or at scale or had it been funded might have led us to an entirely different world today. So the women that I encountered writing my book, Broadband, two of which I will tell you about today, uh, they're not just role models, they're something deeper. They're these sort of latent, hidden possibilities within our own past, possibilities that we can learn from and apply today. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is uh, Stacy Horn. She started an online community in 1989. Now, in those days before the web, of course, online didn't mean the web. It usually meant a bulletin board system or a BBS, which was a text window that you called the phone and paid for by the hour, kind of like a message board. Now, Stacy had been devoted to this very popular BBS on the West Coast called The Well, but she was a New Yorker, and you know, for those of you who don't know the difference between the East and West Coast of the U.S., it's a very big cultural divide. Stacy always felt very much out of place uh, on the West Coast Internet. She didn't want to talk about computers, really. She wanted to talk about art and film, and she felt really disconnected from the kind of cyber hippie culture that was emerging in the Bay Area. So when she started her own online community. She called it Echo, the East Coast Hangout. And she hosted Echo, you know, not in a garage in Palo Alto or in some accelerator funded by big tech telecom money. She hosted it out of her apartment in Greenwich Village on a stack of modems surrounded by toy figurines and paperwork and pictures of friends. Now this advertisement gives you a sense of the culture of Echo. It was very Gen X, very snarky, intellectual. And it was populated by writers and artists and members of the New York media. It wasn't about computer culture. It was culture supported by computers. But there's something else really interesting about Echo that makes it an outlier from its time. Now in those days in the late 80s, early 90s, women made up only a very, very small percentage of the online population. We think maybe 10, 15%, I don't have good numbers on that. But using a female identity in early social spaces, places like BBSs and listservs and multi-user domains, it often led to, if not immediate harassment, then just immediate attention. And so a lot of female users would use male aliases or gender neutral sounding pseudonyms so that they could just experience online culture without being bothered. 
which was great because then gender play was a big part of the early internet and it did all kinds of experimentation that was ultimately very positive. But one consequence of that was that women had a really hard time finding one another online. It was just difficult for women to find one another. Now, unless they were on Echo, because Echo was 40% female. And this made it one of the earliest spaces online to be hospitable to women in any way. Not that Stacy created it as some kind of safe space. I mean, she was really not interested in that. In 1998, she wrote, bite me. <laughs> I didn't want more women on Echo, uh, you know, to make it safe for women. I wanted to get more women on Echo to make it better. She wasn't creating a refuge or making some kind of accommodation to a vulnerable population. Stacey understood that diversity isn't a favor that you do to the underrepresented. It's an asset that serves the entire community at large. Stacy knew that women meant more perspectives, more conversation, and on an online service whose success was predicated on compelling conversations for its users, that made the whole system just much better. Now, to be fair, Stacy had all those female users because she was the only founder that was actually trying to court women. She would do things that other people in tech were doing at the time. She would recruit people from non-technical spaces. Like she would go to bars and parties and art events in New York City and just ask people who seemed interested if they had a modem. Um, she made access free for women for an entire year. If a woman left the service, she would call her on the phone personally, ask what went wrong. She created private spaces on Echo where women could talk to one another and report instances of harassment if necessary. She spoke to women's groups about the internet. She taught Unix classes out of her tiny Greenwich Village apartment so that a lack of technical knowledge would not be a limitation to new users. But her main strategy for recruiting women wasn't just this boots on the ground stuff. It was actually baked into the design of the system. See, back in those days, online communities were moderated by hosts, which were users who received free access in return for the responsibility of guiding and you know, managing conversation, much like hosts at a dinner party. And we still have these kinds of moderators in some places on the internet, on Reddit, for example, but most moderation today has been outsourced to this shadow world of traumatized contract workers who have very little relationship to the communities that they're moderating, which leaves our online communities with vanishingly few tools to establish collective identity or take care of each other. Anyway, not so on Echo. In fact, every conversation on Echo, of which there were hundreds, always had two moderators, a man and a woman. When in dial into her service, oftentimes experiencing online culture for the first time, they saw themselves represented, not just in the power structure of this place, but in the culture of it. And that made it so that they would feel less inhibited and more likely to jump into the conversation rather than just lurking. Echo actually still exists. It's one of the oldest continuously operating online communities in the world. It's 30 years old because Stacy never sold, she never franchised, she never advertised, she never even indulged in the fantasy of a, like a lucrative IPO, not even during the height of dot-com bubble hysteria. She never even made the jump to the web. In fact, this is what Echo still looks like today because when Mosaic, the first web browser, came along, Stacy just couldn't afford to build a web interface. Why am I you about this person who created a service that um, is very much outside of time? Well, she never got rich. She's not some big famous tech billionaire. She's not um, you know, comparable to some of the other people that we lionize in the history of tech, but her accomplishments remain massive to me because she managed to do two things. She achieved gender parity on an almost completely male-dominated internet because she cared enough to make that happen. And her platform has actually remained online for 30 years, surviving all the ups and downs of tech in that time, nurturing a small but very devoted family of users because she's cared enough to keep it that way. And that's a word that I feel like we don't hear enough of, care. I mean, we don't hear a lot about care in relation to online space or online services. And for a lot of people in the power centers of tech anyway, caring means caring about. It means being passionate, it means investing in a big idea, taking big risks, um, building something new with no immediate promise of success. And all of that is amazing and admirable. But what Stacy's legacy represents to me 
is a different kind of caring. It's, it's not just caring about something, it's caring after something, caring for something, continuing that commitment of care from the excitement of those initial moments, from the excitement of the pitch, to the much more tedious workaday, very human, very messy realities of the technology once it's been built. And this kind of work is something that our culture still very much associates with women. And in Silicon Valley, at least, professional domains that are associated with this kind of work, like community management, for example, and they have a preponderance of women whose skills are not always seen as being technical skills. But the way I see it, you know, it's a really technical skill because the software is a mechanism by which human beings facilitate tasks for other human beings at its simplest. And in order to do that effectively, you know, one has to understand the task, one has to understand the mental model of the people approaching that task, the context in which they operate, and how to translate all those messy human realities of life into something functional. One has to determine whether you are solving a problem or simply creating new problems. One has to go beyond simple metrics of you know, growth and stickiness and market share and actually consider implications like mental health, and civic life and community and society at large. And social skills are essential in all of that. And by social skills, I don't mean you know, getting along well with people. I mean, being able to see a technological object or a technological system as enmeshed and entangled within a larger social context, within a world populated by human beings. And ultimately, yeah, I mean, caring about those people and what happens to them. Now, I know that something like Echo, as romantic as it is, can't realistically compete with its inheritors, but I always come back to Stacy's story because it represents for me this great lost opportunity. You know, what if the architects of our present day social media platforms actually had made the same kinds of effort at representation and inclusion and mutual respect that Stacy made? And what if those values, that approach was actually integral to how we built things rather than something tacked on after the fact, after people have already been hurt? And the thing is, not to be essential, but Stacy isn't an outlier. If you are looking like I have been zoomed out, looking for women in the history of technology, it really does help to look first where users have been cared for and to look in those places where form gives way to function, where capital gives way to community and where metrics give way to meaning. Let me give you another example. So this is Wendy Hall, Dame Wendy Hall. Actually, she was given uh, the female equivalent of a knighthood in 2009 uh, for her contributions to computer science. But around the time this photo was taken, she was still a lowly lecturer at the University of Southampton. And she wasn't even a computer scientist. Uh, her field was mathematics, topology. Um, she wasn't interested in computer science because she found it dry and impersonal until she discovered something called hypertext. Now, you know, we really associate hypertext with the web today. We think of it as being kind of coeval with the web, but you know, hypertext is much older than the web. And since as early as the mid 1960s, it had been the study of connecting images and ideas and text together in closed computer systems through the convention of linking, basically turning all the digitized data that computer memory was beginning to make accessible into meaningful, applicable knowledge. It's a very exciting field. And Wendy got turned on to hypertext in the mid 80s through this totally wild, anachronistic British computer system called the Doomsday Project or the Doomsday Disks. Essentially, it was a countrywide effort funded by the BBC to digitally document British life, a kind of time capsule. Uh, and it was released in 1986 as two laser disks that you could navigate by pointing and clicking. Now, the disks were really ahead of their time in many ways. Uh, they included lots of multimedia material, like virtual walks through the British countryside, kind of early VR experiences, if you will, and images of British cities and maps and first person accounts written by school children all over the country, all indexed and easily navigable in this system. But what knocked Wendy out about the Doomsday Discs wasn't so much the material. I mean, she was British, she knew about England, but how it was navigated. So here you can see a little bit of what the sort of main navigation of the Doomsday Discs looks like, a sort of point and click CD-ROM-esque experience. Now, this is 1986. This is a long time before the World Wide Web normalized this idea of pointing and clicking through graphical interfaces. 
And it was hugely novel at the time to, you know, move around a screen following visual cues and this kind of geographic layout. It suddenly made all of this kind of impersonal data feel intuitive and immediate and exciting. It made it comprehensible to people who weren't in computer science departments. And combined with the emerging technology of the personal computer, Wendy realized that, that it actually might make all this previously inaccessible knowledge, stuff that had been locked away in databases and libraries, actually accessible to a lot of people. And that felt revolutionary, and Wendy wanted to be part of it. Now, her colleagues at Southampton told her that there was no future for her in computer science or in her department if she carried on with all this hypertext, hypermedia stuff, which they saw as being kind of soft and fluffy and not as serious as writing compilers and programming languages. But she ignored them. She actually went to the US where hypermedia was becoming more of a thing. And she dedicated her efforts to building a system that would make it possible to navigate library materials much in the way that she had navigated the Doomsday Disks through lots and lots of interconnected multimedia documents. She started with the archives at her university's library, but by 1989, she had built her entire system called Microcosm. Now, just as the World Wide Web would do some years later, Microcosm demonstrated this new, totally intuitive way of navigating information. It made information exciting and dynamic and alive and adaptable to the user. In fact, it wasn't like the web at all. And in some ways, it was better. Now, you all know this, of course, but you know, on the web, <laughs> links are contextual. They're embedded in documents, which means that when the destination of the link is taken down for whatever reason, we get a link rot. We get the 404 error. And that little piece of information that about what connected two different ideas, that metadata, if you will, well, that's lost forever. And that's a big loss for our culture. You don't have to be an archivist or a librarian to feel that way. There's a lot of metadata that has been lost. Now, Microcosm, on the other hand, was built completely differently. It kept all the links separate in a separate database called a link base. And this link base communicated with the underlying documents without leaving a mark on them, which meant that a link in Microcosm was more like a kind of overlay over the material rather than a structural change to the material. Effectively, this meant that you could have a link that went in more than one direction. You could have a link that had multiple sources and multiple destinations. You could layer different links over the same material depending on the level of familiarity or fluency you had over the material. The system was built, in short, to encourage and facilitate learning. And it valued that really, really important piece, that nature of the connections between things, that metadata that was so essential to the design of hypertext systems at the time. It was a good thing. Now, there are actually a lot of tech systems like Wendy's in those days in the mid to late 1980s. Um, they don't look particularly glamorous to us now, but trust they were very important. And they came out of universities and research labs at companies like Apple and IBM, and Xerox and Spolix. Interestingly, nearly every major team building hypertext systems during this time had women in senior positions, if not at the helm of the projects entirely. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of which being that hypertext as a discipline was just more open to people from different backgrounds. If you went to an early hypertext conference in the late 80s, you'd be surrounded by, yes, computer scientists, but also poets and social scientists and historians and all manner of literati. Anyone who was interested in making meaning out of data by making connections and links. It's quite open-ended as a concept. So much part of what hypertext was all about that the very first time that Tim Berners-Lee, I'm sorry, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was given the male equivalent of a damehood for his contributions to computer science, the very first time that Sir Tim Berners-Lee presented a demo of the World Wide Web in the US at the Hypertext 1991 conference in San Antonio, almost all the scholars there thought his system was juvenile. In fact, his paper wasn't even accepted to the conference and he had to lug his $10,000 NextCube computer all the way to Texas on his own dime to demonstrate the World Wide Web on the conference floor. And people took one look at the system, if they took a look at all, and they saw the links were contextual and they only went in one direction. So what good was a hypertext system gonna be if the links could so easily break? And I will tell you a little anecdote about this photo and this moment because it is my favorite thing in the entire history of technology. 
So the demo period of Hypertext 1991 was held at the end of the day after all the presentations and papers had been given. It was also held at the same time as the conference's cocktail hour. And because it was Texas and because it was the summer and because it was the 90s, there was a massive margarita fountain outside. So true thing, true fact, the very first time the World Wide Web was ever being shown to anyone in the United States, to the community of scholars who you would think would be the most interested in such a thing, everybody was outside getting drunk on margaritas. In fact, if you look at this photo, which is one of the only photos of this moment, you can actually see a margarita right there, which means that that very unimpressed looking female scholar wandered in from outside with her margarita in hand to take a look at this whole World Wide Web thing. I just love it. Anyway, we know what happened with the web. In 1992, Tim Berners-Lee published the very first image to ever be clicked on a web browser, a photo of a doo-wop band called Les Horribles Cernet, a group of female CERN employees who sang satirical songs about life at the research lab where he worked. Now, this is also kind of an aside, but I feel like I really have to share with you a small clip of a Les Horribles Cernet music video, and hopefully the audio will work. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's incredible though, isn't it? And if you really want to see more of this, there's lots of it on YouTube. Anyway, after this, obviously, came everything else. The web became the standard. And by 1994, Tim Berners-Lee was giving the keynote at the hypertext conferences. And the more sophisticated hypertext systems, like Wendy Hall's microcosm, those became a thing of the past. There's no way for us to know now if something like microcosm, which solved so many of the web's existing problems, could have been as important to us today as the web is. Just as there's no way to know if uh, what would have happened if Echo had had the funding to make the transition to the web, what social media might look like today. But that doesn't really stop me from dreaming about it. And that's what I mean by the different futures that these women present us with. These stories demonstrate just how many other paths have laid before us and how many other paths might still lie before us if we simply choose differently. And those paths, by the way, if you follow them long enough, they go back all the way to the beginning of the journey. I mean, computing has always been as much a woman's domain as it has been a boys club. I mean, for 200 years, computers were people, female people, female bodies and minds performing the computational labor that made the scientific age possible. And during the Second World War, when human computers were hired to operate the first mechanical computing machines, well, they became the first programmers. And because software is not yet seen as something more important than, you know, patching cables like a telephone operator or handling paperwork like a secretary or doing math like the human computer, well, this was a job that was given to women quite easily. Except, of course, operating one of these early computing machines was not simple at all because they were the first of their kind and they had no operating manuals. They had no precedent. When the mathematician Grace Hopper was first assigned to program the Mark I computer at Harvard in 1944, well, she had to quite literally reverse engineer the machine to which she'd been assigned. She had to study wiring diagrams and take the components apart until she understood its workings as well as, if not better than, the hardware engineers who had built it. Same is true, the first six women assigned to the all-electronic programmable computer, the ENIAC, by the US Army. Now these women are referred to by historians today as the ENIAC Six, although I promise they did have their own names, which I always like to say, <laughs> Kathleen McNulty, Betty Jean Jennings, Elizabeth Snyder, Marilyn Westcoff, Francis Bielus, and Ruth Lichterman, the ENIAC Six. And although ENIAC Six as a moniker served to really obscure their individual contributions to the history of programming, I would say that NX would make a really good name for an all-girl punk band. So if there's anyone out there that is interested in starting one, please let me know. I've already made the t-shirts. Now, in the early days, software wasn't a word. Neither was programmer. And the work that these women did, they were often referred to as either coders or operators. Well, no one really knew what the definition of the work even was. In fact, one of the most brilliant early computer programmers, Betty Snyder, she called her job 
a cross between an architect and a construction engineer, which was a pretty good description of programming maybe even today. But it was through the work of women like these, defining their new roles, that programming actually became something with its own value, something separate from just the manipulation of hardware. It became a language, it became many, many languages, it became an art form. And after the Second World War, it was women who led the development of what was called at the time automatic programming, which is just the idea that programmers should be able to step above assembly code and work at a higher level of abstraction, making it possible for more people to use and access and understand computers, which led to nothing less than the development of programming languages and the evolution of programming as a symbolic art. As for human computers, they began to disappear around the mid-1940s, although in some domains, most importantly in aeronautics, important calculations continued to be made and checked by hand well into the 1970s, which is when NASA formally dissolved its human computing divisions, of course made famous by the book and the film Hidden Figures. But still, in the 60s, women were half of the workforce in computing, and computing was seen as women's work. This is an article from Cosmopolitan, a woman's magazine, 1967, in which Grace Hopper herself compares programming to planning a dinner party because you have to plan ahead and schedule everything so it's ready when you need it. That's how much it was thought of as women's work. So natural for women to want to be good at planning and organizing things. That's what women always do. Now, technology historians, and this is a much larger conversation, suggest that the professionalization of the field of computing in the 1970s led to a kind of implicit masculinization and that things like new professional and educational requirements necessary to become a software engineer in the late 60s and early 70s made it more difficult for women who were interested to get a toehold in the industry and stay there. And this seems to have set this sort of male dominated mythology that has only reinforced itself over the years through frankly marketing images like these. This is an ad for the Apple II and it's pretty clear who this product is marketed to. If you look at computer advertisements for from 1960 to, I don't know, now, you see a lot of this kind of thing. You also see this kind of thing. Products like the Honeywell Kitchen Computer, which was a pretty powerful machine for the time, but it came with a built-in cutting board and a free apron, and it was marketed to women to help them organize their recipes and their household receipts. This condescending copy was certainly not helpful for any woman interested in learning how to be a programmer if only she can cook as well as Honeywell can compute, implying that the computer itself is more intelligent than its female user. And when I was growing up, it was more like images like these, <laughs> things like weird science and films where nebbish boys program their own dream women using bootleg computer equipment. And all this stuff implies that men are somehow more natural to the realm of computing and women are at best accessories to it. And that's just straight up well, it's propaganda. It's not true. It's not true, and many of you, I'm sure, are proof. So, if you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, nothing about BBS communities and hypertext systems and automatic programming, please remember this, that if there is a boys club that dominates any sector of tech today, it's a historical anachronism. It's important to remember that in technology, in history, in life, nothing happens in a vacuum. And new technologies don't just fall from the sky. They emerge along a continuum of ideas. The World Wide Web could not have existed without decades of research into hypertext ideas conducted largely by female scholars. Social media, as we experience it today, could not have existed without decades of experimentation with online community building on the early internet on platforms long gone and a few that still survive. Tech history is so often told as a story of solitary genius, with Tim Berners-Lee and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And yeah, of course those people are remarkable, but they've never been alone. They've always been surrounded by people and ideas because making things big requires big communities. And that's what's so exciting about technology and working in tech, but it's also what makes it so hard to see where things come from. And more importantly, I would argue, to see and imagine where they could have gone and could still lead. When we don't see the multiplicity of this history, 
we leave out a huge part of the story and we make it harder and harder for those other versions of our history to work their influence on our present world and help us to make it better. The misconceptions that we struggle with today, that technology is some kind of boys club, they took a generation to create and they will probably take another generation to fully undo, to say nothing of breaking open even further. But I believe firmly that in a technological world, technological stories are important. And if women and girls are able to see themselves reflected in the DNA of our planet's most profoundly transformative technologies, then they can see themselves more clearly in the future. Now, I write about history and the past, so I don't know much about the future, but I do know one thing for sure, and that is if we are going to survive it, uh, dare I say, if we're going to restart it, then we're going to have the help we can get. Thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. It was, it was just brilliant. Uh, the slide. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so for the last five minutes, we, we asked me some, some questions. Uh, uh, there. Sure. So first, maybe I'll take the first one. Why we don't know this enough? Why we have to wait <laughs> for you to write a book about it? There's a lot of different reasons. I mean, history is complicated, and sometimes understanding history requires a little bit of distance. And, you know, the technology industry is not old, and we haven't had that distance really yet. We are now just beginning to understand everything that went into creating the world that we live in today, and we're beginning to live with and deal with some of the consequences of not fully understanding our history. The second thing is, I mean, I don't know about elsewhere, but in the U.S., we don't really teach the humanities in computer science programs. You know, we don't, we don't teach people these histories when they're gearing up to enter this industry. It's, it's not part of the curriculum, which I think is can be really, really, really detrimental. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wish we understood it more and I think we have plenty of time to dig into it. I often think that, you know, the deeper we get into this coronavirus life, the deeper we get into climate change, I feel like the future is, is short, but the past is infinite and it will always be there to teach us something meaningful. Yeah, and so you showed that the, like there's been a shift at some point, right? When point, right? Uh, female were like engineers, like uh, uh, like just engineers. And and the thing is, uh, at some point there was these ads, these weird ads, and showing that actually computers were for males. Why why this shift happens? Well, you know, it's funny. I often, I mean, I give talks about this, and people are always like, "Oh, men ruined everything. Men, men, men." But it's not really that. It's money, really. I mean the early computing industry wasn't a commercial industry and you know not really until the 60s that it become a, a commercial industry initially it was you know people building computing machines for the war effort and that was much more egalitarian in a way um once it became about selling and buying computers the sort of larger forces of capitalism did their work the work that they always do you know they tried to identify the market sector and and, uh, and sell computers to those people, to the people that worked in industry, who worked in calculation intensive industries like you know, insurance and, and you know, air travel and government. And so I think there's a confluence of a lot of factors. I don't think that there's like some giant man that was like, I'm going to turn this into a male dominated field. It was more the consequence of a lot of different factors coming into play, you know, just the gradual commercialization of the field, the fact that the first generation of female programmers was beginning to age out and maybe didn't have the resources to provide mentorship for the next generation. And the fact that, you know, the way that the computing industry developed, it was quite chaotic in the beginning and, and hardware development was uh, sort of much more well-funded and much more quickly developing than software. There was a long period of time, the software crisis in the late sixties where uh, software program, software was kind of not catching up with hardware. And a part of that was uh, the industry trying to uh, create a professional context for, for programmers. So it went from being this field that kind of anyone with an aptitude could get into. You, know, you used to be able to get a job as a programmer because you were good at puzzles or because you worked your way up from being a secretary or something. I mean, there were lots of avenues, but it got to the point uh, when they were kind of trying to professionalize the field where you needed to have certain credentials, you needed to have, you know, certain educational requirements, which were more difficult for people, perhaps women, who were at home trying to raise families at the same time as pursuing careers in the 1960s. And so, you know, it became much more difficult. And that kind of semantically was marked by the shift from the word coder to the word software engineer, which kind of connote a much more sort of institutionalized uh, approach to to the industry, but well, there's lots of great scholarship on this, and I think we're we're just beginning to understand it. 
I don't know if you know this quote, like those who don't know the past, the errors of the past are condemned to repeat it. How we could repeat it for the next uh, 50 years? How we could avoid <laughs> How could avoid repeating it? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, uh, that's, people ask me this question all the time, like, how do we fix it? And honestly, I think it just comes down to paying attention to who's really contributing. Um, you know, oftentimes history is written by those people who want to be included in the history, right? People who are willing to stand up on a table or at a podium and say, I did this, I'm important. But not everybody who's making a significant contribution is the kind of person that wants to go up at a podium and say, I'm important, write me in the history books. A lot of people are just happy doing the work. They're good team players. They're not out there with a big megaphone, you know, saying, write my name down in stone to remember forever. That's a certain personality type that wants that. So I think it's important to always recognize the contributions of people around you on your team to uh, help validate and uplift voices that are maybe a little bit quieter than the other voices in the room or uh, make sure that you know people are actually listened to and seen and to be really um, transparent about attribution and credit. And uh, you know, I think we can all collectively write our own histories together as long as we can all play a little bit of the historian with our communities around us. Yeah, it's also probably when you succeed, you believe it's by yourself, right? Yeah, but uh, uh, you forget all the people who contributed before you. Uh, you know, this quote, like, we're just dwarves on the shoulder, shoulder of giants, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, As yeah. We, believe, we see higher and further. It's not because of our vision, but because we are elevated by them, like the, the giants before us. So, so yeah. yeah, I think it's. A, I think it would be very beneficial for us all to think more collectively than individualistically. I think, you know, in tech, especially in the U.S., there's this kind of individualistic streak of, you know, people wanting to be unicorns and, and big famous founders and billionaires. But... You know, really, we're all working together. And if we can think of success as being a collective endeavor and not something that just one person or a small amount of people can have, then we're much better off. I totally agree. And just to finish on a, on a, on a good note, uh, Mikwa <laughs> from the, from the, uh, from the um, chat is saying, I'm watching this with my daughter. She is inspired. So thank you for inspiring. Yeah. I love that. That makes me so happy. That's, that's, what, I'm all, that's what I'm here for. I'm yeah. here for the daughters and the sons. More importantly, the sons. <laughs> and the sons too, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure all the sons are inspired too, right? The only reaction we can have from your talk is be inspired. Thank you very much. <laughs> we were really glad to have you. And uh, uh, yeah, we will for sure um, uh, tell you when the, the recordings are done and, and when we can share more about your content uh, across of course. the sons and girls of the world. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Have a good one. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye. So uh, we are wrapping up, uh, but just before we have a last game for people who wants to win an Apple Watch. So if you want, if you want to, uh, if you want to win an Apple Watch, there I have. We have something for you. So I'll just share my screen. I don't know if you see the screen, but yes. Yeah, so uh, this is what we call party time. I know it's hard. Uh, you know, so you may take a drink uh, with alcohol, without alcohol, you decide, right? Uh, but yeah, so we have a small uh, um, networking session. So if you go on the networking tab uh, directly to your interface, right, there is an Easter egg, right? So uh, you will be at random redirected to other uh, people registered at the event, which are uh, still live. And if you find the Easter egg, which is a Darth Vader mask, Right, uh, you will participate to raffle for a, a brand new Apple Watch. So the idea, go to the networking session, like right now, and let's have let's hang out all together. And if you find a mask, yeah, we will take your name and put you in the list for uh, a raffle for a brand new Apple Watch uh, there. So let's network together. Let's connect after a great first day of the event. And for the one who uh, uh, who will just join us uh, for tomorrow. We will meet at 9 a.m. Uh, PST tomorrow for day two about, with a track about microservices and the track about uh, uh, GraphQL, right? So that will be the uh, for tomorrow. For other people in other time zones, for EMEA or for APAC, actually, uh, the live uh, will go in one hour for APAC, for the live, the replay, uh, uh, will go in one hour for APAC and in on nine or 10 hours for, uh, for EMEA, right? So. And again, the talk will be replayed. And uh, so people will be able to see the talk that was